The Paddy Power Half Hour on Off The Ball with Paddy Power the greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen You're very welcome to this edition of the Paddy Power Half Hour broadcasting on offtheball.com all of Off The Ball's social channels we're on Twitter and Facebook as well as YouTube Live at the moment and you can also listen to us on the Go Loud app you can listen back as well of course on the podcast section on offtheball.com uh, coming up this weekend, the runaway league leaders Liverpool make the trip to the only side to take points from them so far this season, Manchester United. We've got some real relegation six-pointers coming up as well. Norwich against Bournemouth and also Brighton taking on Aston Villa. And we've got the Tony Cotty derby as well. It's West Ham against Everton where Darren Randolph will finally get to make his comeback in the Premier League after completing his transfer from Middlesbrough this week. To look ahead to all of these games for this weekend, we're joined by the soundtrack of sport on the Ian Dempsey Breakfast Show. It is Phil Egan. Thanks, Phil. And the presenter of News Talks Team 33, we've got Enda Call here as well, the originator of Enda's Call. Yes. Right, first live game, jumping straight into it. It is live on Off the Ball this coming Sunday on News Talk as well, uh, with former Republic of Ireland international David Myler joining Nathan Murphy on commentary. It is Liverpool against Manchester United. Um, Phil, Liverpool have built such a lead at this stage, but. They take on the team who are the only ones to frustrate them so far this season. Yeah, and that will obviously be playing on the minds of probably Liverpool supporters, not Jurgen Klopp and the Liverpool players. It's just another game. I know it doesn't feel like another game for the two sets of supporters because here you have Liverpool riding high at the top of the league but thinking, wouldn't it be awful to lose the unbeaten record against Manchester United? Whereas United go into the game thinking... You know, not only are they a little bit off the top four, they're so far behind Liverpool and the last thing they want is an absolute hiding. So it, if it, in that sense, it's, it's definitely not just another game for the supporters, but for Jurgen Klopp, it's just about getting the win, taking it off, another job done. And uh, in terms of a hiding or in terms of how this game is going to go, it's not fair to say that maybe with the exception of the last Jose Mourinho game in charge, Manchester have done a decent enough job of frustrating Liverpool in recent seasons? Yeah, it's it's kind of, kind of a sign of where United are compared to Liverpool in their journey at the minute is that United have been going out to stop Liverpool beating them that rather than going out to, to beat them, which they would have been doing all of Ferguson's reign essentially there was United bringing the game to Liverpool rather than the other way about and in the last couple of years United have set set up not to get beaten uh, probably going to do a similar thing tomorrow especially if Marcus Rashford's not playing um, so yeah it's a real it's a real issue with this derby and that's probably why this derby hasn't excited in the last couple of years as well is because United have been just haven't really been taking the game to them haven't been trying to win the game they've just been trying not to lose Huge blow uh, for Manchester United, that Marcus Rashford injury. If this was football manager, you would have probably saved and quit during the week in terms of what happened ahead of a big game this weekend. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer decides to bring him on you know, with the intention of getting a second goal, killing the game. He lasts less than 20 minutes, comes down very awkwardly on his back. From listening to Solskjaer this morning, it seems very little chance that Rashford plays at the weekend. Yeah, well, he said he is not looking likely, but he did say that about Harry Maguire a few weeks ago as well, and Harry Maguire played that weekend. Whether he was playing through a pain barrier or not is it's not for us to say. We don't know, but potential. I, I still think there is potential that Marcus Rashford will play a role of some sort. I was worried that David De Gea was ruled out of the reverse fixture and then played on the Sunday. Yeah, exactly. So it's hard to know where United are with injuries. Certainly, if, Mar if Marcus Rashford is out for this game, that's a massive blow for them because he has been leading the line for them this year. And he, he scored in the last game for United against Liverpool. He's their biggest threat, and United don't look as threatening up front at all without Marcus Rashford up front. Phil, if he doesn't play, how big a blow is it? Yeah, it's obviously a huge blow. He's their top scorer, 19 goals. But what they could do if he doesn't play, and I agree with Enda, I, I, I'm not really taking Solskjaer's comments too seriously because he did say that about David De Gea, and obviously De Gea played. But you think of what they could do, they could put Daniel James playing on the left. And that's probably Daniel James' best position, where he has that ability to cut in, like Rashford does. Then you've still got Martial, the option there if you want. Where does Mason Greenwood fit into that? Obviously, I think from what we've seen of him this season, he just looks like the most natural finisher in that United team. Whether Solskjaer would start him at Anfield, I don't know. I think it'd be a huge call to play him at Anfield from the start. Yeah, because the way you see the game going is... 
similar to what we've seen in the last few seasons where it's all about containing for United and trying to play in the break and you wonder how much of the ball is Greenwood going to see so do they keep him for the second half when regardless of how superior Liverpool are to United at the moment in terms of the, the squad, the quality, the, the points in the league it tends to be a tight game, and that's I don't see anything other than a tight game on Sunday. Yeah, you'd worry about Mason Greenwood's physicality as well, going up against Robertson and Van Dijk on that right. If he was playing on the right hand side, going up against that left sided of Liverpool's defence, so he would probably be swallowed up. <coughs> excuse me by the physicality of the two of the two uh, of Robertson and Van Dijk. So it would be a really difficult game for him. So if he is playing, I would imagine it's going to be a two up front with Martial and. Uh, Mason Greenwood playing as a two up front and James dropping back a little, a little bit further rather than a three up front. And uh, you have to say Greenwood quite impressive this year as well. He's probably trajectory going towards maybe 15 or 16 goals for the season at this stage. He's ticking along very nicely and considering his age, it's been a remarkable kind of breakthrough season for him, hasn't it? Yeah, 10 goals this season for a 17-year-old who hasn't really played all that much. We'd kill uh, for Troy Parrott to be getting this kind of game time in numbers. Yeah, exactly. It kind of puts a bit of a hole in Jose Mourinho's ar- argument that he's too young to be playing and I, sp- I suppose Mason Greenwood might be seen as a little bit more talented than Troy Parrott at this stage of his career, but he's a natural finisher, as Phil said. A lot of similarities to Robin Van Persie, and I'm weary saying that, but just the, the way he carries himself on the pitch, he's so confident going forward. Great use of both feet, but once he gets onto that left foot, like he has a great shot on him, and he can really do damage to teams if he can get on the ball and hold it. My worry about him is he's just not physical enough yet. He's not strong enough yet. He he still looks like a seventeen-year-old boy. Isn't he? he so he's left-footed, but he's so two-footed. He did. He took a penalty, didn't he? With his right he foot, right, against yeah. He it? doesn't. He he says he doesn't have a stronger foot. I would argue that his left foot is yeah. I mean, naturally leans onto it. He's yeah. got a decent. But, but he, he, he's, he's so strong on both feet. And that's a, it's a real danger for defenses. How do you yeah. stop that? Absolutely. Like, but most of his goals tend to come with the left foot at the moment. But like you said, he's he is he's quality, and I think they're going to need a big game out of Martial as well. Where, like when Martial is good, he's he's excellent. He's caused Liverpool problems in the yeah, past. Well, that's his debut. His debut. Yeah. Who could forget? But uh, he certainly away from home where. You know he might have to make runs where he's not going to get the ball. That's sometimes something you don't see out of him where he just won't put in the hard yards. When he gets the ball, he comes alive. Yeah, that's that's it. That's great. But yeah, you, you have to be able to put in the runs just to even unsettle the Liverpool defence. And I think if the Liverpool dressing room in in the game before the game, if they see Rashford's not on the team sheet, they'll certainly feel mm. a bit more confident. They'd be confident anyway. We're talking about United's right side at the moment, Phil. In terms of Liverpool's right side of their attack, Mo Salah has been frustrated by United quite a bit. Is it time for him to have a really big game against United now? Well, I know he's going to be on the front of the match programme, so they're build, no give, giving him the build-up. But he, he's going to be going up by the looks of it against Brandon Williams. He was very good against Wolves, and maybe that's why Solskjaer has decided, Do you know what, letting Ashley Young go isn't actually that big a deal because Williams has looked so good. And tenacious as well and you know it's going to be a big test for him local boy knows what it's like to have Liverpool as as a real rival he'll he'll get that whole sense and trying to control his emotion because you know he he certainly looks like he can handle himself and uh, he'd be up for the challenge but um, that will certainly be something that Jurgen Klopp will be looking at thinking they test Williams out early but yeah Salah has had a lot of frustrating afternoons against United. Of course, didn't play at Old Trafford yeah. earlier this season, but you know, it would also be interesting to see what formation Solskjaer goes for. That if he had a few more options, I wonder would he try, try three at the back? Well, yeah. f- essentially a five at the back. His midfield options are very stretched at the mm. moment as well with injuries, so that's a big consideration for United. Yeah, well, they this team. like you're looking at Fred is probably going to play, so does he go with Matic or does he go with Pereira? Does he go with Pereira maybe because? He's you need someone to carry the ball. Well, that plus you know he's more mobile than Matic. Matic is fine when like Matic is still a very good footballer, but he's just not very mobile at the moment. He's and been playing a lot of minutes as well the last yeah. couple of weeks. I'd worry about his legs and whether he has the ability to keep up with this Liverpool team. Yeah, well, you look at Liverpool's engine room. That's uh, like people will point at 
individually how good are Liverpool in midfield? Maybe not as good as well. They're not as good as technically as Man City, but they just run and out. run and run. Absolutely, and that's what they're they're that's they're functional. They get the ball back and they get it out wide. They get it to the danger men. Plus, they do chip in with the odd goal here and there. And when Aldam is a player that a lot of people thought didn't have a future at Liverpool when Keita was signed, but when Aldam just keeps getting better. Mm. And in terms of United midfield, I would assume. If McTominay and Pogba were fit, they would be playing here. But instead, it's a case of Solskjaer having to look at something a bit different. Yeah, and Juan Mata's shown in the last couple of games that he still has a bit of ability in him. Would that midfield lack legs, though, if it's Matic and Mata in there? It depends what kind of United, uh, what lineup United are going for, because the issue with United against the bigger teams, or against the smaller teams, has been they've been too lethargic on the ball, and then against the bigger teams, they're a lot quicker in the transition and from defence into attack. So if they can get that right, like they did against Tottenham and Man City, then I would imagine it's going to be a Pereira, um, Pereira Fred in the midfield, and then a Lingard in the front of that mid midfield, because that's what Solskjaer has tended to do against the bigger sides. But if he's looking to contain this Liverpool side a little bit more, probably going to be a Matic and maybe a Pereira in a more attacking position like we saw earlier on the season, which it worked pretty well. But I, I just worry about Pereira's creativity. He's just, he's just not creative enough. Mm. Liverpool might change formation as well because Milner is obviously out injured. They're short options in terms of central midfield. Like they might go, Klopp might go with a 4 2 3 1 and play Salah up front and could start, obviously he probably wants Mane out on the, the left um, and then Firmino plays centrally, so the, the, the right-hand side. But he could also play his usual 4-3-3 and put Lallana in there because he knows Lallana will give him energy. And uh, so th th that's going to be interesting to see how they, they match up. The, the Klopp will go out with his idea and it's up to how United react to it. And Liverpool in the big games this year have really gone for it from the start. We yeah. saw what they did to Man City, you know, obviously top of the table clash it felt like at the time, you know, the league was a lot less done than it is now and Liverpool went out and pressed them really hard in that first 25 minutes. Yeah. I'd expect something like that again this Sunday. Yeah, but you know what, I think back to the Tottenham game even at Anfield where I remember going into that game I had the same kind of feeling that I have going into this weekend where I think if Liverpool are on it early doors they could win this comfortably and then Spurs scored in the first couple of minutes but Liverpool where they're at now is even when they concede the first goal or they go a goal down you, it's not even a case of will they get back in it's when will they get back in when will they equalise and then push on for the winner that's just where they are at the moment that there's just that belief I suppose the worry for anyone hoping that Liverpool are going to slip up is they're now keeping clean sheets again Alisson is keeping clean sheets. Obviously, there was a spell where he was out of the team because of injury, so Adrian was in. And Got to thank Henderson a lot for this as well, don't we? He's yeah. become a very effective shield in front of that Yeah, defense. absolutely. And Fabinho is obviously back very, like he's back training now and probably come a bit too soon, maybe. I know Jurgen Klopp's due to give his press conference shortly, but Henderson's been excellent there. And uh, as he, like, he, he played in a more advanced role towards the end of last season he was excellent there he's just he really epitomises what Klopp wants from this Liverpool team and it's just whatever you do if you don't have a good day at the office just make sure you outwork everyone so that's what United have to it's a given if United are going to have any chance they have to match Liverpool's intensity I don't think they can do that for 90 minutes there's not many teams that can and the very dangerous rule of three for United this season as well they've won two games in a row now Norwich and Wolves, so they don't win the third game. That's been the rule since last March. Yeah, it's it's such a pity for Solskjaer. Like it's it's a stat that's going to haunt him until he finally gets over that. And I suppose there there's an argument to be made that they shouldn't have had the game against Wolves uh, during the week anyway. Like if they had to put the game to bed the week before, they wouldn't have been in the situation. So he wouldn't be he'd only be going for two ones in a row this time. So um, I can't see them getting that third win this time. Um, it's hard to know whether they're actually going to lose this game, but I can't see them winning it. Mm. They could frustrate and get a draw. Yeah, well, a draw would be a great result for United mm. because it just it keeps the it keeps the momentum going because I know it's a, it's a... But a draw at Anfield, no one's done it this season in the, in the league, that is. But 
Yeah, like it's an imposing home record Liverpool have over the last two years now. Yeah, well, it goes back to April 2017. Big Sam's Crystal Palace are the last team to win there, and you think of all the great teams that have gone to Anfield since. Well, City have gone there. They haven't, they haven't been able to to win, and uh, Liverpool just swat everyone aside. And the difference this season as well is they're they're winning all their games at Anfield, and he's just turned it into such a fortress and. The atmosphere is going to be red hot, and yeah, there there is a worry that the game could disappoint because it has over so many years. But Liverpool won't care. It's just whatever kind of win. That's all they need to do. They just probably Klopp just looks at the next fixture, sees it. He's very good at kind of keeping a lid on expectation. All the talk, pretty much everyone, bar Liverpool, are saying you've won the league, and that Klopp, that's saying to Klopp as well, where. He's instilled it into obviously himself, but the players as well. Where you know what's going to happen though, Phil, if they do avoid defeat this weekend, the talk is going to very quickly turn to can Liverpool match Arsenal and go unbeaten for a season? Yeah, but I honestly don't think Liverpool fans will care. Oh, it's all about ending the 30 years. But I think yeah. now that Liverpool have gone and calendar years don't really matter, but a calendar year without losing yeah, the game calendar over years calendar year. Don't calendar year is nothing. No. But it's nothing. The season unbeaten isn't an impossible thing to do now. It's not impossible, but it's not on Liverpool's radar. Liverpool can start thinking about going unbeaten if they wrap up the league, say, with a few games to spare and they still haven't lost a game. But don't forget, they still have to play City at the Etihad. That's the game they lost last season. They still have to face the likes of Arsenal. They have Chelsea to play as well. So there's a few tricky fixtures. They go to Wolves next week. So... Plus they're in the Champions League as yeah, well, and they're good shot in the Champions League. So the FA Cup, they've got Shrewsbury away, which he can play a, a weakened team and probably still come through that. But, but once they get to the fifth round and onwards, they'll start to think about that as a cup yeah, to be won, absolutely. and maybe attentions might change. In terms of this weekend, then, Andy, you've heavily indicated you think United aren't going to win. Are you going for Liverpool win or a draw? I, I can't see, like I said, I can't see United winning this game anyway, so I'd probably aim for a Liverpool win. Okay, Phil? Yeah, I think... I know going into the game at Old Trafford, I had a feeling that United were going to do something and they very nearly got the win. But I think this time round, I think Liverpool will win. But I think it'll be tight. And just given the nature of who's playing and who Liverpool are playing, there will be a few nervy moments for Liverpool, I think, on Sunday. But I think they'll win. OK, that's half past four on Sunday afternoon. It is live here on Off The Ball on News Talk at half past four with David Myler and Nathan Murphy, a bumper edition of Off The Ball on Sunday as they've also got live commentary of Munster's must-win game in the Heineken Champions Cup against the Ospreys as well. Of course, all of our football coverage here on Off The Ball is with thanks to Paddy Power and we will be discussing odds across the rest of the show as well. For more information on responsible gambling, check out dunlouis.net. Now, looking forward to the rest of the games. And we might start with tomorrow's lunchtime game because... An interesting one, given Watford's resurgent form under Pearson and Shakespeare since they've gone in, and a Spurs team who look very susceptible to dropping points and to losing games. Is there a possibility Spurs could drop points tomorrow against Watford? Definitely, and I suppose the half-12 kickoff is always something that throws a bit of a spanner in the works the odd time as well, and Watford haven't lost a game since Nigel Pearson's first game in charge against Liverpool, and I think they showed signs then that the ship was starting to turn, but if they could get a few goals on the on their on their calendar, then they could um, they could really be dangerous. And we were looking at their squad, and they have the squad. They're not a relegation squad at all by any stretch of the imagination. So they can do damage to this Tottenham team, who aren't uh, who aren't defensively sound. They haven't kept kept a clean sheet in seventeen games. So it's uh, it's definitely one that Watford will be looking at that they can get another three points on the board. Watford, I thought, very impressive against Bournemouth last week, Phil. Yeah. You know, big game, bit of tension around it because of the point situation at the bottom of the table. But Watford went about their business very nicely. Indeed. Yeah, and you mentioned the game against Liverpool and you think back to that game, Pearson's first game in charge, and Liverpool were blessed to not concede that day. Just some terrible finishing from Watford. And Watford are the joint lowest scorers in the league, but I don't think that's going to be the case, say, in two weeks because they're scoring goals now. Deeney is back and he's changed the formation as well. So he's got Decore now playing further forward. It just means Delefeo is out wide where he should be and we're starting to see the best of Ismail Assar who is lightning quick. So you've got two really good wingers but now you have the focal point with Troy Deeney who did play that game at Anfield but there was one chance that came to him and he just didn't look sharp where now he's sharp and 
if there's not an option, like they have good footballers in the team, but if there's not an option, you can always just go long to Deeney and he can occupy two defenders because he's physical. But they look well coached now. They have a, a specific formation. Players know exactly what they're going to do. And I know Cabasele is back as well for, for this game. So it's not a game, if you're Jose Mourinho and Tottenham, you're going to be looking forward to because... They weren't great against Middlesbrough. They're not keeping clean sheets under Mourinho. And there's a real confidence about Watford. They've got themselves out of the relegation zone. Now they need to kick on and make sure that in two or three weeks they're looking up rather than looking down. And uh, what have you made of Spurs in recent weeks? You know, they kind of huffed and puffed against Middlesbrough in that FA Cup third round replay. In terms of the league record, with Mourinho it's really kind of 50-50 so far. From They haven't seemed to be able to just kind of string a succession of results together really. No, they haven't won. We're, we're, we talk about Solskjaer's record that he hasn't won three games on the trot. Mourinho hasn't won two games on the trot since his first three games in charge of Tottenham. So they've been really inconsistent under him. Uh, the fact that Harry Kane is now out injured for potentially the rest of the season, um, it, it's something that the Watford players, it'll give them confidence going into the game that they can maybe go at this Spurs team without the danger of Harry Kane getting in behind them. Um, and it's it's interesting. It's going to be interesting to see what Gets and Fernandez brings to the side. Whether he starts this weekend, he's been pipped as sort of a Musa Sissoko kind of role, where he's up and Who down. Jose Mourinho really likes uh, yeah. Sissoko is one of the players who's enjoyed Mourinho so far. So it'll be interesting to see what he brings to the side this weekend. They definitely need something extra, and they probably need a sitting a sitting midfielder more than they need a box to box midfielder because the defense has no protection and. Their leaky defence has been the key issue with them not winning games this year. You mentioned Gedson Fernandez, one of our what's odds paddy. This would be extremely impressive if it comes in, lads. Would be Gedson Fernandez and Bruno Fernandez both to start in the Premier League this weekend at 66 to 1. I think Bruno Fernandez has a game to play in the Lisbon Derby tonight. Yeah. yeah. There's no way he's getting. If he plays in that game and then plays in the Manchester Derby I'll or Manchester the, Liverpool I'll game. I'll give you the 66 to 1 yourself. Yeah, I think he's going to be at the game at Anfield on Sunday and I'm not sure. That, like I wonder what he'd make of it all, but um, that's provided now he comes through. Like you, you often see, and I, I think back to when Van Nistelrooy was meant to sign for United, and he mm. did his knee in in, the, in training, and there was that footage of him screaming in agony, and that obviously put the the move on hold. But I wonder, does he play for Sporting Lisbon? And I've seen him play for Sporting a few times this season, where he has a. F- a look about him that he doesn't really want to be there so it'll be interesting to see how he plays tonight but Jetson Fernandez is a guy that hasn't really been playing that much for Benfica he's had a row with the Benfica management yeah. which hasn't helped so he's not going to be too sharp you'd imagine no but from what we've seen of him he has good acceleration like he's got a, a good engine on him where he can get box to box and you know he's got quick feet as well what, like, he's He's the star. Like he's got an eighteen-month deal. You actually wonder will Mourinho be there by the time that deal runs out? Mm. What do you think, Genda? Is Mourinho going to be there beyond the summer? Beyond the summer, absolutely, one hundred percent. It's the third year he collapses. You're not so sure, Phil. Well, this is the first time in the Premier League he's come in mid-season, and you can see that he's been really frustrated. So, I, I always felt that. I don't, I wouldn't have much expectation for them this season. I think they might cause a few problems in the Champions League if they approach games the way they did with Liverpool last week where they basically bring teams onto them and try and play in the break. But it's all building for the summer, I'd say. Like, there's going to be little signs between now and May where he just shows Daniel Levy, like Tangana going in there, it's basically, don't really have other options there. So I'm playing this young lad. He'll throw in a few little... He won't throw in another front, unfortunately. No, he, I think Troy Parrott w- will eventually get some game time towards the end of the season when Spurs are out of the running for the top four, which, the way things are going, that might be too long. And if they're still in cup competitions, he might play Parrott in Premier League games. And Mick McCarthy might be on to Jose saying, you've got to give Troy a run because <laughs> we've got the Euros to prepare for, yeah. hopefully. OK, give us a prediction then for Vicar Road tomorrow. I'll go with a Watford win. Okay. Like a 2 so, 1, maybe? Yeah. Both teams are going to score. Probably. So, yeah, maybe a 2 1 because I the think. Watford? Two, yeah, I think set pieces as well. Spurs don't really instill much confidence in set pieces. I, I watched them against Brighton where Brighton had chances there. So, 
Mm. I think Watford could actually get a win there. Okay, well, another one of our what odds paddy for this weekend surrounds the Bournemouth boss, Eddie Howe, him to be sacked on this weekend at 5-1. to one. Now, they've had, we stressed last week, how important Bournemouth's run of fixtures was because they were playing teams around the same level in the Premier League. This again, Phil, is a huge game for them this weekend and they need points so badly now. So think back to when Bournemouth beat United in November. They were seventh. And since then they've lost nine of 11. And this happens, Bournemouth, but not like this. This is the worst it's been. And this is the lowest points tally they've had after 22 games. So this is now you're starting to think they're not scoring goals. I mentioned Watford were the joint lowest scorers. Yeah. Bournemouth, they're there with them. Bournemouth go beyond streaky as well. Because yeah. they went through September without being able to find the net. Got a few points then accumulated in the period in October. Yeah. And now they're back into that horrible run. It goes beyond the streak when almost like it's uh, the norm now that they're yeah. really struggling. And they've, ne- them to. they've never been able to defend. Mm. That's one thing since Eddie Howe has been in the Premier League. They've always leaked goals, but they've always scored goals. Well, now they're not scoring goals and they've had injuries in defence. So you're starting to worry. And I think a lot of us, I think all three of us expect Norwich to go down. Yeah. But this is the perfect opportunity for Norwich to say, yeah, we'll see you in the championship with us next season. And uh, if Bournemouth lose... It's hard to see them getting out of it, but they're not going to. They definitely won't sack him. They can't because he's got them here, and it's hard to imagine Bournemouth without Eddie Howe. But if they stick with him, and if they were to go down, they still have enough that they could get out. But if they were to go down, that he would be there to try and get them back in. And uh, what do you think of Norwich's chances? Unfortunately, last week for Mark Travers, who got a chance to keep goal for Bournemouth as well tried to play it out. Unfortunately, left Nathan Aki maybe a club short with the pass out from the back. Yeah. And that resulted in really leading to them getting beaten on the day. But I thought, quite aside from Travers' mistake, Bournemouth were quite poor last week. And notwithstanding, Norwich got hammered at Old Trafford as well. But do you give Norwich a chance of picking something up? I think so. Like Norwich are one of these teams that you, you feel sorry for them in a way because they do try to play football. And even against United at Old Trafford last week, I know it was 4-0 by the end of it, but they caused United some issues. And they could have they could have had a couple of goals in the first half against the United defence. So they're dangerous going forward. It's just being able to somehow solidify that team. You you you'd think that against Bournemouth, who haven't been scoring goals, Callum Wilson hasn't had a shot on target since, since October. This might be a good chance for them to actually keep a clean sheet. Um, but again, it's, it's looking unlikely. I would say this game is going to be. One of those ones that we think is high scoring, but it ends up no, no. Phil, how do you see it going? Um, I, well, it looks like Pookie's going to be back, and Adam Ada might get more of a run, which this would be a better game to judge him on, rather than away at Old Trafford. And I know Pat and Evan was on off the ball during the week, and he was at the game, and he just said Adam Ada was isolated, he had no chance. But maybe he'd get more game time here. Looking at the table, if Norwich were to win, there'd be a slight belief maybe that they could get a run going to... Get, get Watford themselves. can be the inspiration here. Yeah. Now, the only thing is, I, I think Daniel Fark and Norwich have been very clever in the fact that they know that they don't have a budget to go blow a load of money and then they get relegated anyway. I think they've pretty much come up, see what happens, they get relegated, but then they go back to the championship, they're in a stronger position, a, a league that they won last season. With that sweet, sweet parachute money. Yeah, exactly. And they'd be in a better position. And do you know what? probably be even more game time for Adam Ida with a team in the championship that is going for promotion. If you look at the two sides, Bournemouth and Norwich, if either of those are to go down, you're looking at Norwich as probably the more likely to come back up because you'd worry about Bournemouth if they go down because they've they players. They've breached the 100 million barrier when it comes to wages. They have so many players that are earning high Premier League wages that they wouldn't be able to sustain and then they've spent money. So... It's, it, it could be one of those situations if Bournemouth go down, they could be in the championship for another five, six years, whether they keep Eddie Howe or not. Uh, whereas Norwich, well, like Phil is saying, if they go down, they'll probably come back up next year anyway. And the two teams trying to fight against going into the championship as well are Brighton and Aston Villa. Aston Villa signed Danny Drinkwater when they were badly in need of a striker. He didn't have the best of debuts last week, did he? God, it didn't go well. But... Uh, I read somewhere that Danny Drinkwater has now made his debut for three different clubs against Man City and he's lost all those games. So it was <laughs> his last three, I think it is, his last three Premier League starts 
have all been against Man City. So one for Chelsea, obviously one for Burnley, and then one for Villa. But do you know what? Villa were never winning that game last week, and I can see why Dean Smith threw him in because he needs game time. Mm. Yeah, he so looked, he looked seriously. Like Villa aren't going to go down because they lose to Man City. It's what they do around them, and they've actually got a good record. They're fourteen points from the eight games they've played against teams in the bottom, say, six or seven. So they tend to win those games. We mentioned Norwich. They hammered Norwich. So this is a game where they might actually feel they can get something from. But it's hard to see, unless Jack Grealish is going to do it all on his own. It's a lot of pressure on which their, he's trying. their well, wide attackers to actually get goals now. Too. Yeah, well, we actually said it here on the show last week that the fact that they have no out-and-out striker anymore that Jack Reilly will probably push for, for, further forward and Conor Howrahan will come into the midfield and that's actually what, what did happen. It didn't go well against Man City last week but you were playing against Man City side. Well, who for were, anyone on the last yeah, team last week. I, I'm not sure too many sides in Premier League would have stopped that Man City team. So against Brighton, who are going to attack you, who aren't great in defence this season, uh, you'd, you'd think Jack Reilly might be worthy of a goal this week. Okay, um, forty to one. The odds and what odds, Paddy, for Danny Drinkwater to score an own goal at the Amex tomorrow? So uh, maybe we're hoping he has a terrible start to his campaign. Say it by Pepe Reina as well. That's it. Pepe Reina likely to keep goal. You'd imagine tomorrow. Well, he was in the stands last week. Yeah. I wonder if he was thinking about his life decisions while he was watching <laughs> Man City yeah. uh, bang in those five goals. Um, we'll do some maybe some hot takes on the other fixtures this weekend. Then, Enda, give me a shout on Newcastle, Chelsea. Chelsea win. Arsenal, Sheffield United, Phil. Draw. Darren Randolph back in the goals tomorrow end of for West Ham. He's just over that thigh injury. They had to push through the transfer this week. And he's going to play against uh, David Moyes' old side, Everton. How are West Ham going to get on? Yeah, nothing like bringing in an injured player to replace another injured player. Uh, it's a good move for Darren Randolph. Uh, what's going to be probably the last three or four years of his career. Um, probably not going to see as much game time as he would like, but I mean, he has to think about his, his future as well. And moving to a Premier League club is definitely a, a smart choice. He's going to get a a bit of game time leading up to this, At least for the next this two Ireland, weeks, which this is Ireland game, which is, yeah. which is massive. So uh, I saw West Ham against Sheffield United last week. They were unlucky at the end, but until they brought Snodgrass on, to be honest, they were, weren't really threatening up front. But uh, So I'd expect maybe Snodgrass might get a start against Everton, go a draw, to be honest. Okay, all that to look forward to this weekend. Don't forget your ACA insurance with Paddy Power as well. If you are having an accumulator, money back is a free bet. If one leg of your four-fold same-game multi lets you down, terms and conditions apply, and that's across top UK, Irish, European, and senior international football. And there is a maximum free bet of €10 Euro per day, and terms and conditions apply. Thanks for listening to the Paddy Power Half Hour. We'll speak to you again next Friday. The Paddy Power Half Hour on Off The Ball with Paddy Power the greatest football partnership since Jeff and Heskey